SEC with um, Kyler Kerbison of the Believe in Tennessee Football Network. Um, Kyler, tell me about Tennessee. I mean, other than everybody transferring away in the offseason. <laughs> yeah, that seems to be the entire story surrounding us. But uh, we do have some transfers coming in to take over those spots that we missed. Um, you know, the Juwan Mitchell transfer, he's a linebacker coming from Texas, is huge for us. Uh, cause we're really thin on defense. Uh, I've told a few people now, I feel like we're going to be Ole Miss from last year where it's offense, offense, offense. We're going to score a ton of points, but that defense might struggle a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I see our game being pretty exciting. Yeah. And, and I kind of agree with that. The Ole Miss defense from last year and the Ole Miss offense from last year and Harrison Bailey looks like a pretty much a prototypical Josh Heupel type quarterback. How's he developing through spring? He's looking great. Honestly, I, I got to go to a practice um, early in the spring. And in my opinion, I thought it was Maurer's job. I, I thought he carried himself like a leader. He was the one, um, you know, putting himself forward, uh, just doing all the intangibles that you really want. And uh, I didn't really see that confidence out of Bailey, but you can get to the spring game and Bailey can sling that ball around, man. He, I mean, his arm ability is what sets him above the other guys. So I feel like between those two and also Hinton Hooker and Joe Milton come from Michigan, whoever wins the job had to go through a gauntlet to get there. And that makes me feel good about whoever actually is the number one quarterback starting the season. All right, let's go with an Ole Miss um, legacy son, Jabari Small in the backfield. Um, how's he looking so far? He always is the guy, right? Yeah, yeah, I, I love him. And one thing about our backfield, you're probably not going to see a single back. It's not going to be the Derrick Henry kind of offense where you, you see one guy, maybe a guy comes in on third down. It's going to be a rotating door. We have a few backs that I feel like – we could have three or four get 500 yards this year um, and everyone get some playing time. Everyone keep rotating, especially with this high up tempo offense. That's going to be going so fast. Conditioning is going to be a huge factor, which I'm sure you guys are used to watching the offense that Lane had last mm -hmm. year. You know, it, can you keep up in the fourth quarter? So if we got guys who can rotate in at running back, it's going to be very helpful for us. Yeah, and just for you guys to know, the way that the substitution works since they move so fast is generally by series. Mm -hmm. um, there's no substitution play to play unless something went wrong just because they want to go as fast as possible. It's, it's actually pretty cool to see. Yeah, honestly, I, I've seen some up tempo offenses that uh, have really taken advantage of a tired defense where they'll have a receiver run a go on their sideline. And then as soon as he gets 40 yards downfield, just run to the sideline and they've bring out another guy where the ball was uh, before if it's incomplete pass. So it's just stuff like that, um, you know, one word plays that can go out there, which I saw when I went to practice, are huge in an up-tempo offense because I got an up-tempo offense my last two years at Tennessee under Butch Jones, and it made a big difference going against those defenses, especially those big hulking guys in, you know, the Alabama defensive front that you're going to go against. All right. Now, um, we talk about all that, but it doesn't make much difference if there's no talent on the outside. What does the wide receiver position look like, like for Tennessee? Well, we have guys from last year that, that did perform. Um, Jalen Hyatt, uh, who was a freshman last year, he, he's coming in his second year. He was able to get a lot of playing time, uh, even though being a freshman. We got you know Jones Jr., who transferred from USC last year, and – uh, you know, we brought in another one in Javante Payton from Mississippi State, who is a very good athlete, a very good playmaker. You know, he had a breakout game versus LSU last year, the first game of the year, um, and kind of fell off, which had to do with injuries. And, you know, Mike Leach not really playing him as much. Um, but I, I feel confident about the wide receiver room. And, and with Heupel's offense and, and how it works, I feel like you could really place a lot of guys there and he's going to get them in the right scenario. He's going to get them open. I mean, Elijah Moore is an a, a incredible athlete. And, you know, watching him and what he did last year was amazing. But there were also plays 
where no one was around him. I mean, he was wide open, and that is Lane Kiffin right there just Mm -hmm. drawing up the plays versus the defense, making it confusing, making it to where his guys, his playmakers can get, you know, that far open. And I feel like Hypo can do those same things. Yeah, Hypo is wanting to run a system similar to mine. It's not exactly the same, but it's kind of but what I refer to it as is the offensive system is designed to torture linebackers. They can't be right. <laughs> Uh, yes. They they drop back and take away the tight end and the slot over the middle. The running game is wide open. If they come up, you have those guys wide open. It's terrible. They can't be right. It's the closest thing to basically mental torture that a college yeah. football player can have. Oh, I would agree. And that that is uh, – it is fun to see as an offensive lineman, especially when those linebackers have no idea if you're coming up to block them, uh, you know, no idea if you're doing a double team and um, no idea – if it's a pass or not, and it makes your job a lot easier. And, you know, that is something that scares me this year because our linebacker room is so depleted with the guys transferring. Um, It is small, literally and figuratively. Uh, Not a lot of guys, and the guys that are in there are not very big. So it does worry me a lot. I, I, Like I said earlier, I could honestly see, you know, our game being a – 50 points by both teams kind of game, like one of the most exciting of the year. Yeah, it is really interesting. And and actually the story that's going to come up during our game before it happens, I want to see fall camp, but the back part of the defense, the back five, those mm-hmm. that group has been completely remade. We got Jacob Springer, um, a former all American all conference player with Navy. We got Otis Reese who transferred from Georgia and we got a bunch of talented freshmen. And what you don't know this guy, but you will um, after the game. His name is Tysheem Johnson. He has a little bit of honey badger in him. It's amazing. Ooh, okay, okay. You know, you, hey, that's a special guy to have. If you can compare him to honey badger, that's a special guy to have. Yeah. Well, let me ask you, how are you feeling about you guys' this recent linebacker going into the portal? Um. Well, I – I don't really know too much about that. I know we have um, Chance Campbell coming in from Maryland, mm-hmm. um, and it could have something to do with that. You never can tell. Whenever you're dealing with the mind of 18- to 22-year-olds, as <laughs> you are well aware, you really can't predict what is going on. It's going to be a, um, a loss for Ole Miss, but at the end of the day, I don't expect it to be um, necessarily – horrible i'm not a doom and gloom guy if a person goes into the portal i mean i'll just move on to the next one in the group that we already have yeah exactly Mm -hmm. i i feel the same way i sometimes i feel like you know the fan base might want me to be a little more pessimistic and uh not be so positive but a lot of the times i am you know i always believe that we can win a game um and maybe that's the player in me maybe that's the you know because i played i always believed I could win a game even if we were playing number one Alabama. It's just Mm -hmm. um, something that you want to do when you're going into the games. But, yeah, I think think our loss of Toa Toa was a little bit bigger (laughs) than than some of the losses that you guys have had. And and it it definitely hurt a little bit in the heart to see him go to Bama especially. The biggest transfer that you guys had that just really messed with me, I'm a huge Eric Gray fan. I've okay. been for two years, ever since he was in high school. I mean, Ole Miss coming in second in that recruitment. And him going to Oklahoma, A, I'm not going to get to see him every week. Mm-hmm. Um, but B, he's going to he's going to hurt you, uh, your offense considerably because he would perform quite well in this UCF Josh Heupel system. Yeah, I agree. I completely agree. Uh, him and Chandler both, I think they're uh, very mixed – running backs they're not just a runner they're not just a pass catcher they can do both and so valuable you know having that two-headed monster in the backfield last year and it does I mean it does suck well I mean I think we're up near to you know 30 plus guys who are transferring this year and it, this is a whole new world in NCAA football it's just it's just crazy how easily guys can change their minds and, and be able to just play in a school in the same conference. It, I mean, right away that that's going to be, it's going to be kind of insane, especially with, you know, name, image, name, image and likeness coming out mm-hmm. and just the opportunity to go to a different city. If you really want to, I mean, I could see guys going to bigger cities, even other smaller schools like a New York or, or a Boston or a Chicago. If, if it's, 
you know, a smaller school in that in that realm, if they're able to be a big part of that city, who knows? You know, that is um, a good point that you bring up. Rutgers could be a surprise winner of this name, image, and likeness situation. Yeah, exactly. I mean, would you rather, you know, get your name out in a big city? Would you rather be, uh, who knows, an L.A. team? Or would you rather be down in the South and, and, and you know, be in a Knoxville, be in a in a Athens? It's just – you kind of got to make those decisions when you're picking a school. All right. Um, what are you looking forward to with this football season? It looks like we're going to get back to normal. Um, what are you looking to see for the first time in 18 months? I am looking to see a live game. That's that's all I want, man. I just want to be able to go and sit in the stands and enjoy a live game and see all of the things that go with it, be a part of the vol walk, see the tee, run through the tee, it, those kind of stuff you really miss uh, once once it's taken away from you. And I don't expect you know us to win a boatload of games this year. I don't think we're gonna you know we're gonna be fighting for maybe an opportunity to go to a bowl game. And I am realistic in that way. So I just want to see good football. I love the fact that we're gonna be an offense based team because I'm an offensive guy. So it makes me feel a little bit better, uh, you know, going into the season. Well, let's let's do this. Who are, who are your non cons this year? So we've got Tennessee Tech. Uh, we start with um, uh, Bowling Green. We got Tennessee Tech. We have Pitt, and then I'm trying to remember the last one, South Alabama. Okay. So yeah, that sounds like um, just off the hands three three and one. So you have to do three and five in the SEC. Yes, you got, yeah, you have, yeah. You have Alabama permanently on the schedule. That doesn't look good. Georgia doesn't look good. Florida. I don't. I don't know about Florida. That that's a game that, in my opinion, you guys are going to be fit to su- surprise because I'm not a hundred percent sure they're not going to put a square peg in a round hole with Emory Jones down there. Yeah, I, I honestly felt great when seeing you know seeing Trask leave and those wide receivers mm-hmm. leave, and I, I was you know, felt that Emory Jones is no way a QB one in the SEC. He just doesn't seem like he's quite there. Uh, you know, I have no idea how he's done over the spring or, you know, progression that he's made, but I definitely see that as a weak point, but they are still Florida. Mm-hmm. They, you know, it's always going to be a tough game. Um, and honestly, over the past few years, Georgia has been a closer game than Florida for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, yeah, that Alabama game is never never fun on the schedule. Yeah, the Georgia game being closer is just because Kirby will not take his thumb off the offense and let them <laughs> go. He, will, he wants every game to be 17-14 to 14 when 28-21 to 21 would be perfectly fine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm. I mean, if he uh, if he just let it go a little bit, it might make a difference. Uh, might not have to uh, – those nail biters, those Hail Mary games that we've had a few times uh, with them. But, yeah, I, I think three and one is definitely possible, mm. those non-conference games. Obviously, Pitt, you know, being a higher opponent for us, a better opponent for us. But it's – you know, it's also scary just not knowing exactly what this team is going to look like with all the transfers. You know, that first game of the season, there's always times where – you're going to have penalties. You're going to have mistakes that you didn't expect because it is the first game and just hope that we can get over that hump. Um, and then, you know, a transfer from South Carolina and quarterback Bentley went to South Alabama and he's undefeated versus Tennessee. <laughs> so it, it's, it's always worrisome uh, when you see a quarterback who just has our number, uh, even, if, even if he is at a different school and not an SEC team. Yeah, if you look at the SEC, you got Vanderbilt and you got South Carolina. That's that you have a chance to win both of those. So that's five. So you have to get one more. Yeah, yeah, we have to get one more. I I, I agree with you that you know South Carolina new coach, same as us, Vandy, just being Vandy. Mm-hmm. Um, and hopefully we can squeeze one out. Hopefully you know maybe a Missouri. Uh, I don't know about Kentucky. I feel like. We usually have the advantage versus them, even when they do have good seasons. But I feel that as if they're on the rise. I feel as if they're really fighting for that, you know, number three spot in SEC East behind Florida and Georgia. Um, and it's going to be a big test for us uh, moving forward. So 
hopefully the Missouri game is the one that we can take advantage of and, you know, get those six wins and possibly get to a bowl. Now, can we even go to a bowl? I don't know. The sanctions haven't come out yet from the NCAA, so that might not even be a possibility even if we win six games. Yeah, we played that game, so uh, I do not envy you on that one. Um, I do have a question for you. Um, the Kentucky-Tennessee game, when did that game quit being the whiskey barrel bourbon, bourbon barrel game? Uh, yeah, so probably around early 2000s because I still remember, uh, you know, those Philip Fulmer teams uh, hoisting that trophy. And uh, honestly, I'm, I'm pretty upset that I didn't get a chance to be a part of that. Um, mm. I didn't get a chance to, you know, have a rivalry as – as a trophy and everything like that, I think they wanted to force a rivalry into us and Bandy, even though that has never been one, uh, you know, in state rivals, but it's always the bloodbath. And I think they're trying to push it too much because, you know, like the Arkansas LSU rivalry that went on mm. for so long, the, the, you know, obviously Auburn, Alabama, you guys got Mississippi state, but a lot of these, uh, games have a trophy with them, and that was ours. That was mm. our big rivalry in the East, and it kind of sucks they took it away. But you know, we got a rivalry with Vandy that's very mm. much in our favor, so yeah. that's nice. I understand. You're like, do not uh, is promoting drinking and all that. They may have viewed it like the cocktail party for the Georgia Florida game, but that's not it. Kentucky's known for bor- calls it bourbon. Tennessee calls it whiskey. It's yeah, part- yeah. I mean, it makes it's- sense. It's perfect. I have no idea if it's, you know, technically Tennessee is a dry campus, but uh, they get around the rules a little bit by putting an entire Broadway down the middle of it that can sell alcohol. So <laughs> it's not quite dry in the, in the uh, definitional, you know. <laughs> All right. Um, who are you looking for in the SEC other than Tennessee? What, what team piques your interest? Well, honestly, I would say Texas a and I thought, you know, after last year just getting bumped out of the college football playoffs, not quite making it, I think Jimbo is an amazing coach. And they're the team that feels the most dangerous over in the West, that feels, you know, no shot at you guys, but just feels the most dangerous to knock off the Bamas to, to really give them a run for their money. And, you know, they're a good team. They're – Returning their Neidemeyer, who's just an absolute beast at tight end. Um, and, you know, they just got to find that good quarterback for him. And I think Jimbo can do that. He's had so much experience with great quarterbacks. And uh, they're definitely a team to watch in my eyes. All right. There we go. Thank you very much. Kyler Kerbison, Believe in Tennessee Football, um, part of the Believe Network. I believe I, – I believe – Um, We have Corey Burton from Believe in Georgia Football coming up um, this week as well. So thank you very much for stopping by, and we will have to reconnect once the season gets closer. Oh, yeah. We can talk some X's and O's and go over those offensive strategies our coaches have. Oh, yeah. It's going to be great. All right. (laughs) Thanks, man. Yeah, thank you.